Well, good morning. Uh, some of you look a little sleepy-eyed this morning after the loss of uh, an hour, a precious hour of sleep, but uh, we'll go home and take a nap this afternoon. Amen. Uh, perhaps this past week you had someone at school or work mention Lent. Maybe they said they were giving up something for Lent. And that terminology is not all that familiar to to, to many of us, but it actually uh, is, is practiced and used by certain denominations as a way of, of, of reflecting upon and preparing to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus at Easter. So it's a six-week season. And so sometimes people will say, uh, I'm giving up something for Lent, meaning that for that six-week period of time, they're going to uh, fast from food or or some other kind of luxury in, in preparation. And, uh, and so the, the Lent begins with Ash Wednesday, which was this past Wednesday. And maybe you saw people around with a, 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 an ash cross on their head. Uh, and, and so th- that happens on Ash Wednesday. And it marks the beginning of this fast, this six-week period of denying yourself of certain things. The day before... Ash Wednesday is called Fat Tuesday. And the deal is that if you're going to fast from food or liquor or whatever it is for, for the six weeks that are ahead, you go out the day before on Fat Tuesday and gorge yourself on this before you, you give it up. Uh, Fat Tuesday in French is Mardi Gras. And, uh, and so what you see are people who go to places like New Orleans for Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday, and they work real hard to sin as much as they can in one day because they're entering into this season of self-denial for six weeks. And, uh, and, and so that's the Lent story for, for us today. Actually, we're, we're not that much into this business of Fat Tuesday and Ash Wednesday, but it's still very valuable and helpful to us to return to the gospel in preparation for the celebration of the, the death and resurrection of Christ at Easter to prepare our hearts. And what we're doing is re- retracing the activity of Jesus in those la- the last week of, of his earthly ministry before his death and resurrection, the week that changed the world. And um, <clears throat> so let me ask you to open your Bibles this morning to, uh, to, to Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12. It is traditionally believed that uh, this week for Jesus started on the first day of the week when he made what is called his triumphal entry into, into Jerusalem. Uh, he rode on a donkey in, in fulfillment of prophecy in the Old Testament. And, uh, and, and in, in doing that, he is officially and formally uh, presenting himself as Israel's king. And, uh, and so this all happens, as we said last week, happens at Passover, uh, the most important of the Jewish holy days. And it is required for every Jewish male to, to come to Jerusalem and present himself to the Lord at at Passover. And and so the city was packed with hundreds of thousands of people. And and, and, and of course, Jesus is there because he is righteous and he's going to participate in this when his people, but he also has a much bigger uh, assignment for for that week. So we rode along this road into the city of Jerusalem and we're told, we saw last week how the road is packed with throngs of people who are crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, meaning, please save us. So some of those who are lining the road believe that this Jesus could could be the Messiah who will save the Jewish nation. And uh, and so we're told that he spent Sunday night back in the little village of Bethany where he had friends, and then he begins Monday with an event that is recorded in Mark in Luke, and here in Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 12. We're going to read just a couple of verses here. It says that Jesus entered the temple area, 
and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Incidentally, uh, John's gospel records a similar event, a very similar event that happens at the, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and uh, where he goes in and cleans house in the temple of the Lord. And so here we see in Matthew 21, Jesus doing it once again. Now, the observance of the Passover physically and spiritually revolved around the temple. And, uh, and so Jews were required to bring their sacrifices and their offerings to, uh, to be presented at the temple. So just to, so you can have this picture in your mind, if you can just imagine the layout of, uh, of the temple. Uh, what verse 12 calls the temple area. There's the difference between the temple area and the actual temple, the, the, what is called the sanctuary. The temple area would have included a number of, of uh, courts. Around the outside, around the perimeter, was called the court of the Gentiles. And so there anybody could, could, could come. Uh, and, uh, and then you walk through a gate and you're in the court of women, the court of the women where all Jews, including women, could enter. Then you went through another gate, and you're standing in what is called the court of Israelites. Here, only Jewish males are permitted to enter. And then you walk through another gate, and you are in what is called the court of the priest. Now, it's in the court of the priest that the altar where offerings are, where, where sacrifices are burned is... Um, is there in the court of priests. So if you're a Jewish male bringing an offering, you would hand that animal to the priest who would take it then into the court of priests and offer the sacrifice there on the, on, on the altar. And then beyond that was what's sometimes called the sanctuary, which included the outer part, which was the holy place. And then beyond that, the most sacred holy of holies where only the high priest could enter uh, once a year. And so you can see this layout, and, and so hopefully it understands, you, you can understand what's going on in the temple as Jesus is, uh, makes his way into this place. Now, the court of Gentiles, where all of this is happening, is a noisy, smelly place. It's chaotic. It's a cross between uh, a flea market and a stockyard. If you can just imagine that in your mind. Remember, People are coming from all over the world uh, to observe the Passover, and typically they would all be required to pay a temple tax, and that temple tax had to be paid with a temple currency. And so there were specially authorized agents known as money changers who had the concession to exchange money. So if you came, say, with your Syrian coins, well, you can't pay your temple tax with Syrian coins. You have to pay it with a temple currency, so you exchange it. Sort of like going to Chuck E. Cheese. And you eat your pizza, and then you're going you're gonna to play the games, but you realize that the, the machines, the games, won't take your quarters. You have to go to a machine, and you have to exchange your, your, your dollars for tokens that will be taken by the various games. And the same thing is happening here. So, so to pay the temple tax, they had to exchange. And of course, um, this was a huge racket for the money changers because they always added on kind of a surcharge that went into their pockets uh, as a fee for the exchange. Now, on top of that, the Jews would requ were required to offer animal sacrifices, whether it's lambs or goats. If you're really poor, you can offer uh, a dove. And, uh, and, and typically, because people are traveling such a great distance, some of them hundreds uh, of miles to get there, it, it's, it's impractical to bring along your own animal. But no worries, the, uh, the Jewish authorities have, uh, have that covered for you as well. They have these specially authorized agents who will be happy to sell you an animal. But again, this is a racket because the, the typical Jewish person at Passover would end up paying several times more than the actual value of that animal. And, and so the, it, was, it was pure uh, extortion. They're getting rich. 
on the back of the worshipers. Again, all of this is taking place out in what is called the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles was there so that non-believers could come and get a glimpse of the glory of God and the worshiping of God's people. But sadly, that isn't happening. They're not seeing worship. They're not seeing prayer. This has become more like a bazaar. And the priests who were supposed to be leading the people of God to worship and to seek the Lord were, were all a part of this, this racket that uh, was making many people rich. So none of this was, was, was envisioned by the Lord when he, when he set up the temple. What's supposed to happen there? And, and this is a very visible representation of the, the spiritual condition of the people of God that there was no real true worship happening for most of them. And, uh, and, and this has all degenerated into an, an ugly scene. And so it's into this crowded, noisy, stinky, uh, bizarre setting that Jesus walks to do some spiritual house cleaning. Now, you may be sitting there wondering, I came to church today to learn about the Jewish temple. Uh, man, I, I need a job. My marriage is in trouble. I, I, need, I can't pay my bills. What in the world does this have to do with me today? Well, I want you to hang on, stay plugged in, because you're going to see that this has everything to do with you and your relationship with God and how you approach him as a follower of Jesus. Now, this, this uh, particular incident is, seems to be out of character for Jesus. And yet, as we dig into this, we're going to see that, that there's, there's actually some, some qualities of Jesus that we might miss if we're not careful. This is, yes, not the typical Jesus that we are used to seeing. But we don't want to make Jesus in our own image. Let's let him speak to us and show us about himself. So what do we learn about our Savior from this incident? Number one, we notice his focus on, on our worship, his focus. Matthew 21, 12 says that Jesus entered the temple area. And so that's his focus. This is, he's like a laser focused on that. He's concerned about how people approach God He's concerned about how they worship. Jesus riveted his attention to the spiritual lives of, of God's people. And he himself has already said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so he, has, he, he holds the key to the very presence of God. So he's, he's focused on that. Now, there were a lot of things that were wrong in Israel in that day. And so Jesus could have gone and picketed out in front of the governor's palace where, Herod, uh, where Pilate lived. Or he could have gone and banged on the doors of the fortress of Antonia, which is this massive structure that hovers over the temple area where the, the Romans could watch what was going on below so that no insurrection would occur. But as was, and that isn't where Jesus focuses his attention. He focuses his attention on the heart of the problem. It's on the spiritual lives of the people of God. Their, the greatest need was not to be free of Roman oppression. The greatest need for, was, was for them to be right with God, and that's where Jesus focuses. And so rarely... If ever do we see Jesus this intensely agitated, but he is, and for good reason. The spiritual life of God's people is a mess, and he's there to straighten it out, do some spiritual housekeeping. And so, his focus. But then also from this, we see his authority over our worship. His authority over our worship. We're told in verse 12 that Jesus entered the temple area, and immediately he's in charge. And so what is he doing? He is throwing out those who are buying and selling. He's kicking over the tables and the benches of people who were selling stuff. 
And he did that because he has authority to do that. In verse 13, he says, this temple is my house. And he has the authority to clean his own house. And that is what he is doing here. Don't miss the emotional intensity of what's happening. So these little Weasley guys, as I at least see them in my, in my mind, these little Weasley guys are sitting on their stools with a stacks of coins on their table, and Jesus walks in and, uh, and just starts kicking the tables over. And uh, the, the incident that John records in John chapter 2 says that Jesus made a whip And with that whip, he physically drove out the animals that were being sold there. Um, And so you could see this physical presence of Jesus. He's he's not little baby Jesus, meek and mild here. He is is taking charge physically of this situation. But it's more than just his physical force. What What is really prevalent here is his spiritual authority. He could have just come in and said, out, and they would have all run away. He has the authority, the moral authority to do that. Out, you don't belong here. It was like when he raised Lazarus from the dead. You remember that story? There was Lazarus dead in the, in the grave for days, and Jesus walks up and just said, Lazarus, out. And here comes this Man who's come to life, still wrapped in his burial clothes, just with a word, out. That's the the moral authority of Jesus over his house, over his temple. And so God is concerned about the worship of his people. Jesus said in verse 13, you've made my house. By the way, this is a house of prayer. This is, he has indicated that. He, he quotes Isaiah 56, 7 there, where he, where he says uh, that my house will be called a house of prayer for all of the nations. It's not a house of prayer he walks into. You, you see, prayer and sin can't exist at the same time. The psalmist said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. And so there was very little concern for true communion with God in the temple. This was not a house of prayer. In fact, he said, you have made it into a den of robbers. So he goes from quoting Isaiah to quoting Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the Lord is confronting his people. And he said, listen, you have made this temple into a den of robbers. A den is a place where robbers, where criminals would hide, would, uh, would, would, uh, would, would escape in order to keep from being caught. And so what Jesus is saying there is you have made religion a place to hide, a place to cover up your your sin and a place to cover up your uh, rebellion against the Lord. So Jesus came into this temple to vindicate his holiness. That's the third thing we see about Jesus, not just his focus and his authority, but also his zeal for holiness. When, When John when John tells about this incident that happens earlier in Jesus' ministry, he says that the disciples, when they saw Jesus doing this, immediately thought about Psalm 69 and verse 9, where it says that the zeal of the Lord consumes me. Zeal for your house consumes me. And so the Lord is zealous for, for our holiness. He is zealous for the glory and the holiness of his own name. And so he comes into this setting to vindicate his own holiness to, and, and to people who had completely lost sight of the holiness of God. He is there to restore it to its rightful place. He is zealous for, for our holiness. He's consumed with the zeal for the purity of our worship. But what happens next reveals yet another aspect of our Lord's character. And that is his compassion for the hurting. His compassion for the hurting. Look at verse 14. He said, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Now that's an amazing contrast, isn't it, from 
we, from, from where he was in the face of confronting these, the, the, these religious leaders who were hyper in their, in their observance of the law, and yet on the inside there was corruption. And so he goes from confronting them then to being compassionate toward the people who weren't supposed to be in the temple to begin with. We know from reading the Old Testament that the blind and the lame were excluded from the corporate gatherings of the people of God. They couldn't go into the temple. They had to hang out on the, on, on the, in the court of the Gentiles. They, 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 were, they were to get as close as they could to the presence of the Lord because they knew how much they needed to know the Lord and to, to be in his presence. And so here is Jesus. After just slamming these religious leaders, he turns with tenderness and compassion toward the blind and the lame. This is, this is such a tender moment where you see Jesus balancing his intense holiness with his tender mercy. It's a tender moment. But it's also a very powerful moment because you, you see here, I, I love the way Matthew puts it. He just casually says the, the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. And, and oh, oh yeah, he healed them. Just like that. No big deal. What a display of power for Jesus for these hurting individuals to come to Jesus and just tenderly, he heals them. What an amazing display of his power. And, 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 and so when blind people get to see for the first time and lame people get to walk for the first time, you can bet they're not going to be quiet about it, are they? And so probably the temple halls are just echoing with the shouts of these people who have been miraculously healed. Hey, hey, look what Jesus did to me. And so there is this, this, this atmosphere that changes in the temple as people begin to pray. That It was truly wonderful, wonderful. People were caused to wonder. They were full of wonder at what Jesus did. And that leads us to the next thing about our Savior that we learn from this incident. Number five, it is his right to be worshipped. His right to be worshipped. Look at verse 15. And when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. So Jesus is worthy of wonder. He's worthy of our worship. He has done wonderful things and it's right for us to worship him. But these uber-religious guys here we're not at all interested or concerned about the blind or the lame. They're not interested in the little children. And they're certainly not happy about the fact that this Jesus is being worshipped like he's God. That's blasphemy. And Jesus has been in their face and he's exposed their hypocrisy. And they are furious about it. They're not worshipping. They're furious. But... But, uh, of course, the, the little children, they, they see what these, these theological experts don't see. Look at verse 16. Do you hear, the, the, the religious leader says, do you hear what these children are saying? They, they ask him, yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? I just like to imagine that Jesus must have had a little smile on his face when those religious leaders said, Jesus, do you hear what they're saying? He says, yeah. So what? They're speaking truth. Again, they saw what these theological experts couldn't see. That's why Jesus would say over and over, if you're going to come to me, you have to come like little children. In fact, in Luke's account... Luke has Jesus saying, listen, if these children don't sing their praises, then the rocks under their feet will have to cry out. He is worthy of praise. He has the right to be worshipped. Now, I said earlier that this is more relevant than you may realize. Because this isn't just about a physical building in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. 
when we zoom out a little bit and we look at the gospel and the message of the New Testament, we understand that, that God is up to something here, that he isn't just concerned that his focus has moved away from a physical structure in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. It has moved to a new temple. And that temple, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, becomes a human heart. So the temple is not a building. It is the heart of a person that is surrendered to Christ and becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we go from just being really religious to on the outside to, to, to being truly righteous on the inside by what Jesus Christ did. And so that's what would, what would cause Paul to say to the believers in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3.16, he says, don't you know that you yourselves, you yourselves are God's temple and, that the, and God's spirit lives in you. Don't you know, don't you understand now that your life, your heart is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And so we know that the only way that for a sinful human being to become a temple of a holy God is for Christ to do something amazing in us. And that's the gift of eternal life. When Christ comes and, and makes us new, he sanctifies us. He holifies us, if you will, so that we can become a temple, the temple of the spirit of a holy God. And so Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You see, now it's not just going to a place to worship. Your body now is a temple of worship. The Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own anymore. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Again, he is zealous for our holiness. He is zealous for the purity of our worship. Now, I have a couple of questions that I want to wrap up with this morning. I want you to think about this very seriously today. First of all, what is in the temple of your heart that ought not to be there? What is in the temple? that ought not to be there. You know, in the Jewish temple, Jesus' day, there was all kinds of corruption. Well, we have to deal with that in our own hearts. Is there anything in the temple of your heart that shouldn't be there? And so Jesus is coming in. He's Lord, and he's kicking over these tables. What tables is he kicking over in your life? It may be Bitterness, some, some attitude, unforgiveness towards someone who has hurt you. Maybe, maybe it's lust or, or just excessive worry. What is it? What is the table or tables that Jesus is coming in and kicking over in your life? Question number two, what ought to be in the temple of your heart that isn't? Number one, What's in your heart that shouldn't be there? Number two, what ought to be in your heart that isn't? Is it purity? Is it a passion for the holiness of God? Is it compassion for hurting people around you? Is it praise and worship? Maybe you have crowded prayer out of your life. There's no room for it. You've just, there's, at best, it's a little whisper now and then to God, or maybe when you sit down to a meal, but fervent prayer, that temple, that house of your heart can't be called a house of prayer because there's not much going on in the way of prayer in your life. What ought to be there that isn't? Now, here's what I ask us to do. We, we've just got to do some business with the Lord. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head right now. And let's just let Jesus into the temple of our heart today. Let him do whatever business he needs to do. That he has the 
authority to kick over whatever tables he wants to right now. And I want to ask you to do something this morning physically to demonstrate that you're serious to the Lord. Sometimes we need to act with our bodies to reinforce what we're saying in our spirit. And this morning, if you are if, if you are dealing with something that's in the temple that ought not to be there. And you're saying, Lord, I confess and I repent of that. What what a wonderful promise, the Word of God, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to do house cleaning, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, all of it, And listen very carefully here. You have to come just as you are because a lot of times we don't think we can come to Him until we have the solution. We figure out what needs to be done and then we come to Him. No, come as you are. Just into the presence of the Lord and say, Lord, you know that messy corner of my life and I need you to come in and just do house cleaning there. to restore things in the temple that ought to be there. Purity and prayer and praise and compassion for others. Lord, fill me fresh and new with your spirit. And if that's the kind of business you're doing with God right now, I'm going to ask you just to, to do something bold, just to stand. I'm standing. Not because I don't have a place to sit. I'm standing because... I, God is doing it work in my life. Is He doing it in your life today? Would you stand? Maybe this altar is a place where you would come and just Get on your face before God. Come just as you are, not with the solution that you're asking God to do, but just coming just as He calls you, just as you are. This altar is open. You can come. as as we possibly can. I want to interrupt anything. If you're at the altar, just stay there. If you're standing in the presence of the Lord, stay there. But I'm going to invite all of us right now just to stand and as we worship. Come into the presence of the Lord. Make this place a temple of praise and worship to the one who alone is worthy.